So what we're going to cover over the next uh, 25, 30 minutes or so is REDS-based heart failure management. And we're going to talk about using some new technologies in order to guide our choices of heart failure therapies. So I certainly don't need to remind this audience of the importance of congestion and heart failure. It is the most common symptoms that patients experience, that breathlessness, waking up in the middle of the night, short of breath, needing extra pillows in order to be able to breathe. It's the most common reason why patients seek medical attention. It's why they come to the emergency room. If you come to the emergency room and you have heart failure and you're congested, guess what? You're going to get admitted. It is associated with reduced quality of life. If you can't walk because you get short of breath, if you can't sleep at night because you're waking up short of breath, it's going to reduce your quality of life. And we know that congestion is not just a nuisance, but it's associated with worse outcomes. Being congested at the time of hospital discharge is associated with a high risk of readmission, and it's also associated with higher rates of mortality. This is illustrated here when we look at patients who are hospitalized with heart failure. Well, not surprisingly, 90% of them are congested at the time of admission. But what's worrisome is that almost a third of them or more are still congested when they leave the hospital. And that persistent congestion at the time of hospital discharge, as I mentioned before, is associated with a higher risk of readmission in the short term within 30 days. And it's also associated with worse survival. Now, is it that we as providers don't care or that we don't know how to look for congestion when we're taking care of hospitalized heart failure patients? And the answer is absolutely not. We look for it all the time. The reality is if we think about what happens to a patient who's hospitalized with heart failure, what do we do? We put you in bed and you sit there for three or four days and you watch TV. Maybe you get up to go to the bathroom. Maybe you get up to take a walk. But in general, you're not exerting yourself very much. So not surprisingly, after about two days in the hospital, patients say, I feel better. We know that they may still be congested and we look for those typical signs. Are they using pillows? Do they have lower extremity edema? What do their lungs sound like? But the reality is that we oftentimes miss it. And therefore, when they go home, they still have the signs of congestion and maybe it manifests very quickly. And other times we might miss it even at home. So how do we bridge this gap between knowing that there's congestion there and being able to actually detect it? Well, we need some additional tools. And we know this from looking at CardiMEMS using an implantable pulmonary artery sensor that we know that pulmonary arterial pressures tend to go up before you have overt evidence of pulmonary congestion. Once you develop pulmonary congestion, maybe you can use a tool like REDS to be able to detect that pulmonary congestion and intervene at a time before you have worsening heart failure, progressive symptoms, and worst of all, the need for hospitalization. Well, as I mentioned before, we know that congestion is prevalent, and we can look at it across the entire care spectrum. We know in the emergency room that 41% of patients will have severe congestion, but in reality, 70, 90% of them have congestion. If we look at it at the time of discharge, maybe a third of them maybe a quarter of them still have significant congestion. We know that those ambulatory patients who come back to our heart failure clinic are oftentimes congestion. In fact, 25% will have severe congestion and 40% will have at least some signs of congestion. And this is also true in other care environments in both the home health environment and also primary care providers who take care of patients with heart failure. Still, we're seeing you know, congestion rates of 20 to 30%. So, I draw your attention to the more recent ACC AHA guidelines for managing patients with heart failure. And because of the importance of congestion, it's not surprising that it's a level one recommendation to look for patients. When we look at patients with heart failure to look for congestion, we do it in our initial and subsequent histories and physicals to try to tease out whether or not congestion is present. It's also a level one recommendation to do this in acutely decompensated heart failure patients. Not only do we look for congestion, but we have to grade the severity of congestion. And then we should go one step beyond that and say, well, what is the ideal volume status of this patient? What do we consider normal volemia or euvolemia? And then lastly, we need to treat whenever we see signs of congestion, certainly on the outpatient side with oral diuretics and in the inpatient side with intravenous diuretics, and that we should continue to titrate our diuretics until we can get patients in a normal volemic state. 
earlier, well, I was going to say earlier this year is really 2023, but within the last year, there was a, a very well written, comprehensive document put out. Uh, it was a Jack Scientific statement addressing remote patient monitoring for heart failure. And this was born out of a recognition that early telemonitoring, looking for weights and signs of symptoms of heart failure, did not decrease heart failure hospitalization. And what we now know is that we need a different signal to measure. And it needs to be accurate and it needs to be actionable in order to be able to impact the trajectory of heart failure patients while they're still at home and ambulatory. And we know that tracking of intracardiac filling pressures remotely with using uh, a, a device like CardioMEMS, or perhaps even using remote dielectric sensing, the RED system, looking for lung congestion and lung water may be impactful. So Bill Abraham wrote this piece a, a few years ago, which points us in the right direction when we begin to evaluate different technologies for monitoring heart failure patients. And he said that there have to be five prerequisites. And Bill Abraham, whose last name starts with A, came up with the five A's. Maybe it's a coincidence. I don't think so. But what are those five A's? Well, it has to be an appropriate signal. Well, if we're talking about heart failure and pulmonary congestion, doesn't it make sense to look at there's water in the lung? It has to be accurate, meaning that it has to actually measure what it says it's going to measure. It has to be absolute. It has to be objective. It has to be able to be quantified. Very important. It has to be actionable. Once you get that signal, you got to be able to do something with it. And doing something with it actually changes the trajectory. And then lastly, it should be able to be quickly incorporated into an algorithm so that you know how to use it in the course of caring for heart failure patients. So those are the five A's, appropriate, accurate, absolute, actionable, and able to be incorporated in an algorithm. Well, one of those technologies may be REDS. So REDS is, was originally designed as a, a military technology to literally see through walls. We have changed it to a biotechnology and we use it to look through a different type of wall, and that's the chest wall to be able to measure lung congestion. This sensor, this system, uses a, a small uh, radar technology. So it sends out a small radar beam, and it has a sensor that can detect that. And the difference between the this, this signal that's being transmitted and the one that's being received, we can extrapolate from that to know what interferes with that signal, and that interference is going to be lung water. We can incorporate this into a system that is easy to be applied, and as I said before, it will give us an an objective and actionable number to intervene on. So it's just an example of that. This is the system being applied to uh, an, a gentleman, either in a sitting position or in a standing position where you can very reliably place the sensor, the transmitter and the receiver in the right position without very much uh, effort to get it properly aligned. Importantly, a couple things about this. Um, number one, it's non-invasive. You don't have to do anything invasive. It's not like invasive hemodynamics. Number two, it doesn't take long to do a measurement, only 45 seconds. And number three, you can just put it on top of the clothes. It doesn't have to have direct skin contact. So if patients are doing this at home or if you're doing it in the hospital, you can do it over a shirt or over a hospital gown, no problem. Well, is it accurate? You bet it is. So this is looking at measuring the percent of lung water using the gold standard, which is CT scanning, and comparing it to measuring the percent of lung water using REDS. And in the left-hand portion of the slide, you can see that it is a one-to-one -one ratio, whether patients are on the drier side, whether they are normovolemic, or whether they are hypervolemic, there's a one-to-one -one correlation. We can be pretty confident. In fact, we can be very confident that REDS actually is an accurate um, measure of percent lung water. Well, if we look at the right-hand side of the slide, um, in an early model of this technology, looked at the use of this technology and things that would be typical for our heart failure patients in the hospital. Well, what happens when you use PEEP? Well, that increase in intrathoracic pressure tends to push the lung water away, and we can see that the percent of lung water drops both by REDS and by CT scan. Well, what if we give a fluid bolus? Well, lung water should go up. And in fact, we see that both with REDS and with CT. And if we give diuretics, the lung water should go down. And once again, we see it both with diuretics and with CT scanning. 
So REDS does what it's supposed to do. Well, where can we use it? We can use REDS throughout the entire continuum of care. We can do it in the hospital, we can do it in an outpatient ambulatory setting, or we can do it in the home. In the hospital, it can be applied when they're coming into the hospital, in the emergency room. We can see someone who says that they're short of breath, just like we can do a chest X-ray, we can do a REDS measurement and quantify how much lung congestion is there. You can do it while they're in the hospital on a heart failure floor to make sure that they're appropriately decongested at a time when they're telling you that they feel better and you think that they're normal volemic, one can do a REDS reading and confirm that they really are as decongested as we think they are. It can be done on the outpatient setting, and I'll show you some data from our rapid follow-up unit, which was a clinic that continues to run to this day, staffed by one of our APPs, one of our heart failure nurse practitioners. It can be done to make sure that as patients come out of the hospital that they're remaining in a normal volemic state. And it can also be done in point of care testing for patients who come back for an ambulatory heart failure visit. And it may also be used in a home setting for remote monitoring. So patients could put on the red system at home and transmit maybe surrounding uh, an episode of uh, uh, an episode of care around a hospital discharge and maybe do that for 30 days or 90 days. And lastly, we can also move this into uh, other post-acute care environments for example, in nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities, acute rehab and subacute rehab. <clears throat> well, let me give you an example of a, of a typical heart failure case. This was a, an 86-year-old gentleman hospitalized overseas in Japan. And this is a pretty typical heart failure hospitalization. They, they present, they're short of breath or treated with IV furosemide, um, started on uh, guideline-directed medical therapy with a, a vasodilator in Valsartan and helped along the way because of very, very high filling pressures and congestion with IV nitroglycerin. Well, let's look at what happens in that trajectory uh, with the REDS readings. When they came in, this individual was quite congested, 54% uh, percent lung, uh, percent lung water. And after a little bit of IV nitroglycerin and IV furosemide by day two, they're down to 36%, getting close to that green zone where you want to be in that normal volemic zone. With weaning of the ventilator, ongoing diuresis, transitioning to oral diuretics, one can see that they remained in the green zone and at the time of discharge were completely decongested with a percent lung water of 21%, exactly where we would like someone to be. And these changes also correlate with uh, chest X-ray, and we know from our own experience in taking care of these patients that sometimes the radiographic findings may lag behind a little bit, whereas with the REDS reading, it is immediately accurate. So we can incorporate the use of REDS into a treatment algorithm. And that was that last day that Bill Abraham laid out for us. Again, we can orient ourselves in the middle of the slide by saying we want patients in that 25 to 35% lung water range. If you become a little bit congested, you might be in that yellow zone between 36 and 41, or it's possible that you're hypervolemic. If you go above that and you're over 41%, then you're definitely congested and you're hypervolemic. And if you go up over 50, then you're really extremely volume overloaded. And we can titrate diuretics based upon these various readings. Now, on the other end of the dial, if we go to the left of the green zone, we can find out, well, did we over diurese someone? Are they a little bit hypovolemic? And in that case, they fall into a yellow zone there between 21 and 24%. When if they're really over diuresis and you need to like have them eat something salty and drink something really quick, we'll know that their lung water is below 21%. Well, we took this information and we said, you know what, we're seeing a lot of patients in our post-discharge clinic and our RFU clinic. And we said, well, can we use REDS in this setting to reduce our 30-day readmission rate? So let me preface this all by saying that our post-discharge clinic, which was staffed by one of my, uh, my uh, nurse practitioner colleagues, we knew that just being able to go and, and see a, a nurse practitioner after hospital discharge reduced readmission rate significantly. And then we said, well, can we go beyond that? And can we marry uh, a fabulous um, clinic provider with a new technology to further lower readmission rates? So we had 220 patients that were seen uh, by our my APP colleague. 80 of them had 
per visit plus reds, and 140 were usual care. We had mostly a, a male predominant population, about 63% were men, um, and there was a, uh, a significant number of half ref and half ref, half, half patients, about 60, 40, but all were pretty symptomatic. Two thirds were NYHA class three. So what did we find? Well, on the right hand side of the slide, we looked at all cause readmission. 14% if you saw the APP alone and 6.5% if you saw the APP and that visit was informed with the use of REDS. If we looked at cardiovascular readmission, similar trend, almost 12% if readmitted within 30 days with just an APP visit, and that was reduced to a microscopic 2.6% if you combine an APP visit with the use of the REDS vest. Now, we, we observed some interesting things in our data as we looked at this in a Kaplan-Meier analysis, and what we found was that if you went through usual care, there was a pretty um, steady increase in the frequency of rehospitalization over time, beginning about five to 10 days after hospital discharge. But look what happened in the group that had a, a post-discharge visit and the use of the REDS. It seems like we shifted that, we time shifted it out. And what we now realize is that if we can see someone within a week of their hospital discharge, adjust their medications using REDS. And then if we see them again around day 20, we might be able to bring that readmission rate down pretty close to zero. And so we've incorporated that now into our own algorithm to say day seven is mandatory. Day 20, day 21 is strongly recommended to try to further reduce the risk of rehospitalization. Well, putting on a new technology is great, but that doesn't make patients better. Nurse practitioners make patients better. And you do that by using that information to make medication changes. And if we compare what happened in the group with usual care, there were a lot of medications that were changed. More than 50% of the time, either diuretics were changed or there was an increase or change in guideline-directed medical therapy. And rarely did we have to decrease the, the dosage of guideline-directed medical therapy. But when we in, were informed by the use of the RED system, we found that we were less likely to change diuretics and we were more likely to change guideline-directed medical therapy. And this is really important when we incorporate the fact that in strong HF, we learned that those individuals who were able to achieve higher doses of guideline-directed medical therapy within a couple weeks of hospital discharge had a survival advantage and a much lower rate of rehospitalization in six months. Well, we took our experience on the outpatient side and then we brought it into the inpatient side and we said, well, what if we were to test the use of REDS in patients with decompensated heart failure and take half the patients and treat them with usual care? If you've treated them well and you think that they're ready for discharge, go ahead and discharge them. But let's take the other half and say, for those patients where we're convinced that they're ready for discharge, let's do a REDS reading. And if that REDS reading is elevated, certainly if it's elevated and in the red zone, let's hold on to them for a little bit longer, decongest them a little bit more before we send them home. Well, that was what we did. And our hypothesis was that we would see a lower 30-day rehospitalization rate in those patients who were managed on the inpatient side using REDS as compared to those with usual care. And guess what? That's exactly what we saw. Readmission rates in the usual care was 20% at 30 days. Then it was only 2% in those patients who were decongested uh, with additional time spent in hospital with the use of the RED system. And I want to point out that this was done not only here in New York at, um, at Mount Sinai, but it was also done in Spain, in a couple centers in Spain, so that this was truly an international experience. Well, if we move beyond the clinic and beyond the hospital, we can also think about moving into the home and we can use REDS as part of a uh, home health program. And as we all know, the problem is that a lot of patients get readmitted within 30 days and the Medicare readmission rate for those patients who have Medicare fee for service is 24, 25%. Well, the method that we're envisioning is to use a, a care transition program 
and one that incorporates the use of REDS. And we feel pretty confident that if you do this, you can further lower the, the, the readmission rate. And when this was looked at about, there was a 3% readmission rate and a 15% Medicare reported 30 day readmission rate when one followed this protocol. And this not only is good for patients, it's also good for payers. Patients can enjoy the fact that they can remain home, they can be decongested, they don't feel short of breath, but payers also like it because, well, let's face it, heart failure hospitalizations are expensive and it's a much lower price point to manage them at home than it is to manage them in the hospital. We can also move lastly into the uh, nursing home setting in a skilled nursing facility. And this was some work that we had done also at, uh, at Mount Sinai prior to COVID. This is a, an example from an experience in uh, Western Pennsylvania, looking at the use of REDS monitoring to reduce readmission in skilled nursing facilities. And one of the nice things about this is that one can use the REDS system in hospital, track that patient, get an understanding of where they're filling pressures are, what their percent lung water is on the day of discharge, and transition them, them to a skilled nursing facility where they can pick up the, the care there with the use of the RED system. And if one is thinking a little bit more proactively, boy, wouldn't it be great if we know what the trajectory is, could we send them out maybe a day early and let that care continue in a lower acuity setting in a skilled nursing facility? Good for the skilled nursing facility because they have an admission, Good for the hospital because it's reducing length of stay. Good for the patient because it provides continuity of care. And so when we look across all these different environments and we look at the heart failure readmission rate and we do a meta-analysis, this includes a number of patients who are monitored using the, the RED system, you can see that the point estimate clearly favors the use of REDS with a significant reduction in the hazard ratio of lowering the chance of needing 30-day heart failure hospitalization when heart failure care is guided by the use of REDS. So to wrap up, some key take-home points. Number one, congestion is a common problem in heart failure, and it's the number one reason why our heart failure patients are hospitalized. New heart failure uh, guidelines recommend the assessment for congestion, both on the outpatient side and on the inpatient side, and very, very importantly, at the time of discharge. Assessing for congestion accurately can be difficult, not only for non-trained providers, I would consider myself a trained provider. Hey, it's hard for me too. We miss it not infrequently, we miss it all the time. REDS can provide a non-invasive, accurate and absolute measure of lung congestion across the entire continuum of care. These REDS values are highly accurate they're actionable and they can be built into treatment algorithms. And lastly, multiple studies have shown consistent improvement on the inpatient side and on the outpatient side, improvement in patient outcomes with the use of uh, a REDS system, but combined with the right providers. So I hope I've had a chance to um, highlight the importance of congestion, the need to detect congestion, and how this particular technology can help us as care providers to provide the best care for our heart failure patients. And the central person through all of this has been our heart failure nurse practitioner. So I just wanna give a big shout out to Jen Ullman who I've had the pleasure to work with for so many years now, and she's the one who's doing the great work. Again, thank you for allowing me to be with you today. And uh, if you have any questions, I know this is not, uh, there's no question and answer, but if you wanna reach out to me by email, I'd be happy to connect with you. Thank you very much.